So today I'm going to be talking about the recipe for success preventive intervention, which is designed to promote children's self-regulation and healthy eating habits. Um, there are many, many Penn State collaborators on this project, including Mark and Lori and Sukdeep. Special shout out to Michelle Hostetler, who was just an incredible project manager for this. DJ has worked on this, Idan Shalev, Sue Rutherford Siegel, Cindy Stifter. And although Karen Bierman and Mark Greenberg aren't formal collaborators on this, I feel like I need to acknowledge them because um, everything I learned about prevention, I learned from them. Um, so they're collaborators in spirit, at least. Um, we also have many community collaborators um, on this project. And I also have many colleagues here at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and then Cheryl McNeil has also um, really helped with this project and she's at West Virginia University. There are many funders for this project, including the Clinical and Translational Science Institute at Penn State, SSRI, Prevention Center, NIH, UW-Madison School of Human Ecology, and our Center for Child and Family Wellbeing. So this project actually started at the 2011 Prevention Center Retreat, which took place in this red barn on Ed Smith and Linda Caldwell's farm. Um, this um, retreat was focused on childhood obesity um, to coincide with the launch of CTSI, which had issued a call for community-based participatory research projects um, to address a specific topic. And that year, the topic or their um, initial topic that they chose to focus on was childhood obesity. So I didn't know much at all about childhood obesity at that point. Um, but during that retreat, I learned things like one in five preschoolers are overweight, one in eight are obese, and the numbers are higher for children living in poverty. The health risks for child obesity are exactly the same as the health risks for adult obesity. So before working on this project, I had no idea that children could have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, that kidney disease or diabetes is so prevalent among children um, with obesity. There are also lots of psychological risks, including low self-esteem, being bullied or victimized, um, and feeling anxious or depressed. Um, in the United States, because the cheapest foods tend to be the lowest in nutritional content, but highest in calories, some children can be both malnourished and have obesity. It's called the obesity paradox. And I had no idea that this was, um, was possible. <clears throat> obesity in young children predicts obesity in adolescence, which in turn predicts obesity in adulthood. So uh, um, you know, perhaps if we can adjust or shift obesity in childhood, we can have these lifelong impacts. Um, we know that adult obesity is responsible for 20% of healthcare costs in the United States. Um, we all know that um, healthcare in the United States is more expensive than it is in other countries, like um, you know, people um, in like European countries. Um, part of that is due to like this funny um, private system that we have um, where insurance companies take a huge chunk of, um, of our healthcare costs and we you know, spend a lot of money trying to decide who pays for what chunk. But a lot of that, um, a lot of our costs in healthcare are due to the fact that we have more people with overweight or obesity. Um, the per patient expenditures in um, for treating somebody with obesity is about comparable to treating somebody with um, um, who smokes. Um, so at that retreat that um, where I was learning all of these kinds of things, Lori Francis um, presented on a study that she and Liz Sussman had done where they looked at the relation between children's self-control and BMI. So they had um, they had these children come into the lab, do all these different tasks at the end, they told them, you know, oh, you did such a nice job. I have a present for you, but I didn't have a chance to wrap it before you arrived. How about if I put you in this corner, you face the wall, I'll wrap your present, and then as soon as I'm done, you can open it. Um, but don't peek because I want it to be a surprise. Um, but of course, there's a camera focused on the children, and Lori and Liz were able to count the number of peaks. And what they found is the number of peaks during that task at age three predicted BMI all the way through age 12. 
Um, so that was really, really interesting. And Mark Feinberg, you know, saw that and, you know, had this great idea. So the night before the prevention center retreat, Mark and I had um, had dinner and we were talking about this tuning into kids program that I was um, helping to co-facilitate at the Bennett Center and at the public library in State College during lunch hour. Um, which is focused on kind of children's emotional self-regulation and self-control. And he and I were talking about, yeah, wouldn't it be interesting to do some kind of intervention trial where we really test um, a, an intervention designed to promote self-control? And so Mark saw this, um, these results from Lori and thought like, oh, this would be the perfect way to get funding to do the other trial that we were interested in. Um, so we ended up creating this wonderful Penn State team um, that included Mark, who has you know expertise, as you all know, in parenting programs and community-based interventions um, like Prosper, Lori, who focuses on childhood obesity and responsive food parenting practices, you know, I who had this limited experience with um, the tuning into kids preventive intervention, um, focused on self-control or self-regulation. Um, most of my work at the prevention center was around evaluation. Um, we quickly brought in Sateep because of her experience with Early Head Start and her expertise in community-based participatory research. <clears throat> and we also um, wanted to work with Cindy because of her focus on childhood obesity and self-regulation. You know, this is the kind of team that you can only create at a place like Penn State. Um, and so it was really just the perfect, um, cons um, the perfect constellation of um, initiatives by CTSI and having the perfect team to do this work. So early head start turns out to be the perfect kind of partner for this kind of prevention trial. Early Head Start, for those of you who don't know, is a downward extension of the Head Start, Head Start Preschool program. Um, Head Start Preschool starts at age three um, to, and serves children for two years. Um, but in the um, 70s or 80s, they realized that it would be better if they could start a little bit younger. And so Early Head Start provides weekly home visits for families um, starting when parents are pregnant um, and moving until children are three and eligible for the preschool program. They deliver an evidence-based curriculum, which was gonna be great for us because their home visitors already knew about the kind of work that we were doing. They were already trained in doing a um, standardized curriculum. Um, Early Head Start served families living in poverty um, which is, you know, as I said, huge risk factor for um, childhood obesity. Um, and Early Head Start had the infrastructure in place, which allowed for kind of the easy rollout of this program. And if it was successful, it would also make it, um, if, our, if our intervention was successful, it would also make it easier to disseminate the program if we had kind of taken into account um, what Early Head Start was already able to provide. Um, so randomized controlled evaluations of Early Head Start have shown improvements in kind of the quality of the home environment, parent support and engagement and play. You know, parents spend more time reading with their kids and they um, tend to use less physical punishment if they've been enrolled in that Early Head Start home visit program. Um, we also see improvements in children's cognitive functioning, their language development, their sustained attention and behavioral control. Um, we see better or higher rates of immunizations, um, but that's the only health outcome that Early Head Start actually um, shows any movement on. Um, many of the other, you know, they spend a lot of time trying to get parents um, focused on health outcomes, but um, perhaps because of the, um, the attention that like, pediatricians are already um, providing or support that pediatricians or um, Medicaid is already providing to families around physical health, um, immunizations is the only um, physical health outcome that Early Head Start tends to show um, positive effects on. However, Early Head Start wanted to do better, especially around these physical health outcomes um, and obesity in particular. 
So we started this community-based participatory research collaborative where early Head Start identified the absence of effective programs to address childhood obesity. Um, the Penn State researchers responded to that need and broadened the discussion. As I said, you know, Mark had you know, this idea to you know, look back at like root causes. Don't just focus on you know, healthy eating habits, but also integrate you know, an intervention um, focused on self-control because that might make the intervention focused on healthy eating habits a little bit more effective. We spent a lot of time talking to home visitors um, we had a couple of different retreats where we met with, I don't know, 20, 30 different um, home visitors. We um, approached three different Early Head Start um, sites and met with all of their home visitors um, to talk about the kinds of barriers that were um, affecting the families that they served, what made it difficult for the parents to feed their children um, healthy diets. Um, and then we also conducted focus groups with um, parents um, to understand better what it was that they were interested in focusing on um, and what really motivated them to participate in Early Head Start. Um, and one of the things that we found is that a lot of the parents weren't so interested in childhood obesity. And actually, um, for a toddler, it's really hard to tell sometimes whether they have obesity or not, because it just looks like they're retaining a little bit of their baby fat. Um, what the parents were most interested in was having children who could do well in school and who are well behaved. That was why they had signed up for Early Head Start. Um, and so that was important information for us. Um, so through this kind of community-based participatory research collaboration, we created Recipe for Success. Um, and that final design was unlike anything that any of us had done before. And so we were really excited about kind of embarking on this adventure. Really had our recipe for success um, was based on research in four different areas, healthy eating habits, toddler self-control, parent sensitive scaffolding and responsive food parenting. Um, some of the prior research had shown that fruit and vegetable intake during that toddler period is actually the best predictor of healthy eating habits into adulthood. Um, a lot of times vegetables um, tend to be um, characterized by like a bitter or a sour taste. Um, and there are evolutionarily adaptive reasons why toddlers don't want to um, take, you know, to consume food with those tastes that, you know, those tastes also characterize a lot of the poisonous plants that we have in our environment. Um, and so it takes a while for children to, um, to learn to like vegetables. And if you tend not to gain this um, appreciation for the taste of vegetables, especially um, during the toddler period, um, you tend to have fewer or consume fewer vegetables throughout your life. Um, so kind of a responsive food parenting practices that, you know, um, Lori is the expert in, you know, talks about, you know, children need to be exposed to foods 10 or 20 times um, before they'll reliably eat them. Um, we know from other research that, you know, the kinds of foods that parents eat while they're pregnant or um, that they eat while they're breastfeeding um, shape children's food preferences. Um, a lot of times our parents would say things like, oh yeah, I tried to give them broccoli, but my child didn't really like it. Um, and so they give up. Um, you know, they don't know that it takes so many different exposures before a child will, you know, regularly consume something that's better like broccoli. Um, so this was important information for us to know. Um, it's best to not be very coercive, to just kind of present an array of healthy food options and let the child serve themselves and eat what they're, what they're interested in. Um, we also know that cooking at home actually leads to greater fruit and vegetable intake. Um, some of the really interesting research by Leanne Birch and her colleagues there at Penn State was that taste preferences and deliberate self-control are developing most rapidly at the same time. Um, and so, um, we've already talked about how kind of that there's that relation between self-control in the preschool period and BMI. Um, Terry Moffitt has done this really, really interesting 
you know, longitudinal research of the birth cohort in Dunedin, uh, New Zealand, where she showed that self-control in the preschool period is actually related to all kinds of great, um, great outcomes in adulthood. So there's this relation between self-control and preschool and income as an adult, as like a 34-year-old adult. Um, there's an inverse relation between self-control and preschool and criminal convictions as an adult. And there's also an inverse um, relation between self-control and preschool and health problems as adults. Um, as they've um, followed the um, participants of the Prairie Preschool Project, as well as the Abbasidarian project into kind of middle adulthood and even later adulthood. They're also seeing these, um, you know, some of the effects of that preschool program, which were carried by the impact on social emotional skills um, as um, relating to health problems as an adult. Um, so this was really interesting to us and really helped us see that anything we can do to improve self-control in the preschool period could have these really potential, potentially um, important lifelong impacts. Um, interestingly, however, there aren't a lot of effective interventions or preventive interventions for, to promote self-control, especially during the toddler period. They're more at age like four, three, four, and five, um, but in the, pre, in the um, toddler period, there aren't many at all. Um, so one of the things that we learned too from the prior research is that it's sensitive scaffolding, not just sensitivity and responsiveness that um, tends to improve children's self-control. You know, Gary Evans um, and his colleagues spend a lot of time talking about how allostatic load um, indicates how the stress of poverty gets under, under the skin. Um, Jack Shinkoff is the person um, who, you know, first coined this. Um, but then Gary Evans um, and his colleagues have, you know, talked about or have demonstrated that when parents provide sensitive scaffolding, that relation between poverty and child allostatic load tends to disappear. And one of the um, indicators of child allostatic load is um, having overweight or obesity, um, that when we're stressed, um, we tend to crave foods that are higher in carbohydrates, um, and we tend to store um, those calories that we consume as fat rather than burning them off. So this was the logic model for recipe for success. Um, we wanted to um, improve both parent-sensitive scaffolding and responsive food parenting practices. We thought that sensitive scaffolding would affect children's self-control, which would promote healthy eating habits. Um, and we also thought that um, getting or achieving better, more responsive food parenting practices would also lead to healthy eating habits. Um, as I mentioned though, our um, focus groups with families showed that the families weren't really interested in um, obesity prevention. They, it wasn't something that was on their radar. And so for them, they were you know, most interested in having good behavior and academic achievement. And so you know, we were able to kind of frame our intervention as really focused on self-control because that would all, not only help us achieve our goal and the Head Start administrator's goal of promoting more healthy eating habits, but it would also um, help parents see that this intervention could help them achieve their goals for participating in the project. So recipe for success consists of 10 to 12 lessons in which parents and toddlers prepare healthy meals and snacks. Um, this is a really nice way of being able to provide information um, to the parents about healthy eat eating habits um, in a low key way so that we're not just kind of focused, you know, face to face, you know, with them saying, you know, don't do this with your child or do this, but, you know, we're able to kind of distribute or, you know, share these kind of nuggets of interesting information in the context of cooking. Um, so it just sounds um, yeah, less formal and we hope that parents are more likely to um, hear the information and incorporate it into their, in, into their daily practices. 
Um, one of the things that I learned um, during this project too is that a lot of parents don't actually use their um, WIC foods. Um, they don't necessarily know what to do with a bag of lentils um, or um, they don't really have recipes that, um, you know, that, um, you know, would make, you know, something like lentils or rice um, at, appealing for their children. Um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do was, you know, help them learn how to um, put their WIC money to better use. So all of our recipes include just three to five ingredients that meet the WIC guidelines. Um, we always wanted to include a protein and a fruit or a vegetable so that children have that kind of balanced um, meal or snack. Um, and we recognized that a lot of parents don't have um, great um, access to um, you know, kitchens or, you know, sometimes their um, stoves might be broken. So none of our recipes actually required more than a microwave. Um, and sometimes even if there wasn't, if families didn't have a microwave, we were able to um, adjust um, to um, accommodate them. Um, this is the kind of recipe that we would, um, that we created. Um, one of our first project assistants, um, Sarah Ketter, um, created these recipes that um, the families got and they became part of a booklet um, so that they ended the intervention with 12 recipes that they had um, already cooked um, and hopefully would continue to use. Um, we know that children are more likely to eat the foods that they help prepare. They become invested in that final product um, and they, um, you know, the new ingredients become familiar through cooking. Right, so like the you know first recipe that we do is a spinach quesadilla, and the children take you know the frozen spinach and they touch it when it's frozen. They put it in the microwave. They get to push the buttons on the microwave. They take a paper towel and they um, they pat the uh, moisture out of the cooked spinach. So they're interacting with it in a different way. They put it on the tortilla, they put it back in the microwave. So by the time they're actually ready to eat the um, spinach, um, it's become a little bit more familiar um, and less scary. And so we hope that that kind of neophobia, which is the um, fear of new foods, might be a little bit less intense through you know, these hands-on activities. Um, cooking also really provides, you know, incredible opportunities for children to kind of practice that self-control, right? If you look at, you know, like this picture of this little girl pouring, uh, um, you know, a glass of milk, you know, look how hard she has to concentrate so that it doesn't spill. So, you know, we want, you know, in order to develop self-control, our theory was we really need kids to kind of be involved in that sustained um, in that sustained period where they're really, really focused and concentrating on something. Um, so um, cooking provides, you know, lots of those opportunities. It provides the opportunity to kind of control your body. So stirring something is pretty easy for us. For a child, it's really hard not to stir it so um, dramatically that, you know, the ingredients end up um, being all over the floor. Um, we want children to persist in challenging tasks, kind of take turns with their parents and coordinate their activities with their parent. That all of these are the things that, you know, we suspected and there's good research to show, you know, are, are really kind of the foundational um, practices that um, allow us to develop these self-control skills. Um, and this is, you know, as I said, the period in children's development where, you know, that self-control is really first coming online or that deliberate self-control is coming online and developing most rapidly. Um, cooking also provides lots of opportunities to wait patiently. So, you know, like when something's in the microwave, children have to wait. Um, and we know that, you know, from the work of people like Pamela Cole, that, you know, if children have a um, specific strategy, um, to distract themselves, they're going to be more effective at waiting patiently. Um, so one of our early Head Start collaborators came up with this waiting song that children will sing while they're in the um, while they're you know waiting for something like the microwave. 
Um, and we, you know, talk to the parents about how you can substitute lots of different ways, you know, lots of different words and use this lots of different times. So instead of waiting for your food, you could be waiting for the light at a street corner or something. Um, you know, talk to many early Head Start home visitors who say that you know, the song ends up, you know, haunting them in their sleep, that it's by far that one of the more popular parts of our program. So the advantages of cooking with young children is that um, cooking can be adapted for children of all different um, skill levels. Um, you know, all of you who work with toddlers know that there's a huge, huge range in skill and um, among a two-year-old, you know, that some of our two-year-olds have, you know, two or three words at the most, and other children are speaking in full sentences. Um, the nice thing about cooking is that, you know, some things are really hard for a toddler, and some things are really hard for a grown-up like me. Um, and the nice thing is that we were able to kind of titrate or tailor um, each lesson so that the kid could be involved to the um, extent that they were capable. Um, children also just love this grown-up activity. Um, it's really, really exciting. Um, a lot of times in our home visits, you know, uh, you know, the father or maybe a grandparent will walk through the kitchen or an older sibling will come by. Um, and you know, they are, you know, they all express interest in what's going on. Um, and you can tell that the children just feel really proud at um, being involved in this. Um, what we hoped is that like once we kind of set up this, the scene and helped parents see how they could incorporate um, their children into cooking, that every time they cooked, the children might be more likely to ask to be involved. And so it would be one way that we could help ensure kind of the sustained effort of our intervention after our lessons ended. Um, the advantages for parents of, of these cooking activities was that parents have to cook anyway. You know, we really um, try to help parents reframe that concept of quality time, that it doesn't have to be taking your child to the park, that it can be just involving them in preparing their lunch. Um, we know from different um, surveys that 65% of millennials report enjoying cooking, um, and that cooking and feeding is this just primal form of nurturance. And so many of our holidays involve food, um, and so we hope to kind of tap into you know some of those um, primitive urges um, in the parents, um, and that this would be a more exciting intervention than one that involved, you know, having the parents sit on the floor and play blocks with their children, for example. Um, but we talked to the parents about the fact that, you know, cooking with a two-year-old is really hard. Um, and so we um, used these strategies that Cheryl McNeil had taught me in a workshop many, many years ago um, from parent-child interaction therapy that therapists use to um, you know, teach parents how to be super reinforcing for their young children. Um, and that involves kind of describing behaviors, you know, making sure that parents reflect um, the children's utterances, providing lots of praise for their effort and giving choices so that children you know, feel more efficacious and feel like they've had a say in the outcome. Um, Michelle Hostetler, you know, said that, oh, these four behaviors, um, one of the ways that we could um, rename our, our um, intervention is recipe for success with the number um, to help parents remember that these are the four behaviors that are kind of core to any change um, through our intervention. Um, so we show parents um, as a way of kind of helping them understand the importance of describing behaviors and helping them um, practice that skill. We show parents a picture of this Christmas tree that was drawn by you know, a preschooler um, when they were just asked by their parent to draw a Christmas tree. Um, and then, um, this is from Cheryl McNeil and, and her work, um, and then Cheryl asked the parent to have the child draw another Christmas tree, but this time to describe what the child did um, as, as they were going along. Um, so be a sportscaster. Um, and you know, this is the um, product that the child created you know, five minutes later. Um, and the only difference is that you know, the first one um, shows 
you know, what the child could do on their own. The second one shows what the parent can really pull out of the child if they kind of help scaffold um, the child's attention um, and show that they're really interested in what the child is doing. Our hope was that if parents could master those four core parenting skills, um, they couldn't hurt but um, be more sensitive and better support their children's learning. Um, so that was the theory, at least. Um, our intervention provided a, um, a pretty detailed um, curriculum. So we had kind of an outline on one side of the page, um, and then we provided a sample script. And we knew that um, our parent educators weren't going to be able to read the sample script, but we told them to read it before they go through, you know, before they go to the visit, just so that they have a better sense of what, you know, how they could make these activities as rich as possible. So, you know, on the left side of our um, of our curriculum, it might say something simple like stir ingredients together, but the sample script. You know, says, tell your child you will work as a team and take turns stirring these ingredients. Tell your child that you will be the, you know, that you'll each be a stirrer and a holder and that the stirrer will slowly and carefully mix the ingredients and the holder will hold the bowl in place. You know, and then give your child a choice and ask them if they would like to be the stirrer or the holder first. You know, it doesn't matter to the parent which one they do, which one they choose, that these kinds of um, individual choices are really, really reinforcing and exciting for a toddler to have. Um, and most of our parents don't really provide many of these kinds of choices for them. Um, in Recipe for Success, we substituted 20 to 40 minutes of a normal like 90 minute um, early Head Start home visit um, with our curriculum. So they, most of our partners were already delivering the evidence-based parents as teachers curriculum. Um, and we asked them to just put that on hold for 12 weeks um, and do 20 to 40 minutes of our program instead. Um, our program met all of the early Head Start performance standards that the, um, that the home visitors had to um, be addressing in the um, in their home visits, with the exception of something like um, dental hygiene. Um, and so our home visitors um, were just able to, like, after a child ate their snack, they would take them and brush their teeth. Um, and so um, home visitors didn't have to worry about doing anything in addition to our curriculum. Um, our curriculum didn't add extra home visits or extend the length of home visits. Um, and interestingly, um, in our design, it was the same home visitors who delivered our lessons and the regular um, parents as teachers lessons. So um, in our design, we randomized families within home visitor caseload. So um, each of our um, home visitors had some families um, receiving recipe for success and some parents receiving what they would normally have um, received in early Head Start. So eight years ago, I actually presented to the Prevention Research Center on our first trial. Um, we had 73 early Head Start families. Um, about half of them were families of color. We randomly assigned um, within um, Within home visitor caseload, we did these extensive assessments at pre and post intervention, um, and we had really positive results um, in all four of our target domains. Um, with the sense um, I presented at um, the um, at the prevention center eight years ago, we um, published um, those results in pediatrics. Um, and so since then, we've also started this new second trial, and that's um, the results that I'm going to be sharing for the rest of today. Um, we, in the second trial, we had 242 parents and toddlers, um, almost two thirds are families of color. Um, we offered this in seven different cities um, in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Um, as part of um, this, we've collected over 500 audio recordings to um, listen to what actually happens in the early Head Start home visits. Um, and I think these data are pretty rare. I don't know of anybody else who has anything like this. Um, again, we had extensive pre and post intervention assessments. Um, but for this trial, we also conducted nine and 18 month follow-up assessments. 
as part of all of our assessments. We um, included um, video recordings of parent-child interactions. And so we've coded over a thousand video recordings um, over the last few years. Um, and we also um, took um, cheek swaps from our parents and children's to assess um, telomere length. In the, um, the difference between um, the first trial and the second trial of Recipe for Success was that in the second trial, we focused a little bit more on teaching those core parenting skills. Um, some of the feedback from the first trial was that it's a lot for home visitors and a lot for parents to try to cook with their child and to try to engage in these different kinds of behaviors. And so instead of bringing out the food right away, we got some wooden food and we worked with Cheryl McNeil and her students to come up with these trainings um, to really get parents good at the descriptions and the reflections, um, the giving choices and giving praise for effort, not just you know something like good job, but I really like how careful you're being right now. Um, we tried to improve the quality of the materials. Um, so um, as I showed you, our recipes looked much nicer than they did with the clip art that I created when I was at the prevention center. Um, and we tried to make the, health, the recipes a little bit healthier as well. So again, this was our um, logic model and um, we assessed outcomes in each of these four domains. Um, and what we saw is that those kind of core parenting behaviors, which we rated from the videos, um, actually looked a lot better if a family were randomly assigned to the intervention versus the control. Um, so this was pretty exciting for us because, you know, as I've been describing, all of our intervention took place in the kitchen in the context of cooking. Right, but um, for, for our assessments and our um, parent child video interactions, we um, had parents bowl with their children. So they um, got these stuffed bowling balls and a stuffed um, pens. Um, parents knew kind of how bowling was supposed to work, but most of our toddlers didn't know. Um, and so it was really interesting to see how the parents were able to apply those skills they learned in cooking. Um, as they bowled with their children. We also had them um, build a tower with different shaped blocks or sized blocks. Um, and we had them create a, or do a um, shape puzzle where the parents couldn't touch any of the pieces. Um, and so it was really exciting to see that the parents had been able to generalize from you know, our cooking lessons and apply these same skills in these other um, interactions with their children. Um, in general, their learning support behaviors um, were also much higher um, and their technical scaffolding um, was marginally higher. Um, second, we wanted to see um, about the um, responsive food parenting practices. So we would um, do things like, you know, have parents give their, we would give parents a packet of dried seaweed, which is something that you know, virtually none of our parents had ever tried um, and virtually none of our, our children had, had ever tried. I certainly had never tried it before we, you know, we came upon this. Um, and I don't know if any of you have um, tried dried seaweed, but it's got a really interesting and strong smell um, and a really interesting and unusual texture. Um, people either love it or they hate it. What we wanted to see was you know, how parents introduced this new food to their children. Um, and what we saw is that if parents had gone through recipe for success, they were much more likely to um, engage in these kind of responsive, non-coercive um, food parenting practices. So doing things like, hmm, I'm going to taste just a little bit to see if I like it or not. Would you like to, you know, so they would model it for their children, you know, and then offer their children, um, you know, the opportunity to taste it if they would like, um, but don't put a lot of pressure on it, uh, on them for doing that. Um, you know, and we also saw that kind of the overall sensitivity um, that the parents showed in these tasks um, was much greater if they had participated in our lessons versus just the regular early head start lessons. 
Um, and I just want to quickly acknowledge um, Sukhdeep Gill and all of her incredible research assistants who watched countless um, videos of parents eating with their children and just did such a, a phenomenal job of scoring all of these data. Um, and so it was really exciting to see that these intervention effects that we hoped might be there um, actually emerged. Next, we wanted to look at children's self-control skills. We um, um, Sorry, I just checked my time to see how I'm doing. Um, so we had children, um, we did things like um, test them to see whether or not if we put an M&M on a plate, if a child would um, wait until we told them the time was up. And what we saw is that, yeah, children who went through our intervention were more likely to be able to resist that temptation. Our observers or our interviewers who were um, working with the children at their house during the um, assessments rated um, children who had been through Recipe for Success as more likely to, um, to show high levels of task orientation and attention. Parents were rating their children as being more compliant and less dysregulated, having fewer sleep problems, fewer eating problems, fewer meltdowns. So we were excited to see that. And then finally, we were interested in seeing whether um, our intervention shifted um, children's eating habits. And what we saw is that children were much more likely to continue to be involved on a daily basis and helping with their meals and snacks. These were based on these daily diaries um, so we called the parents and asked just what happened during the day. Um, children were also more likely to eat the nutritious food, so have um, meals or snacks that included a protein and a fruit or vegetable. And children started our intervention with overweight or obesity, but we saw is that they had a lower BMI um, for age percentile. Sorry, this slide is backwards. The blue line should be smaller than the red line. Um, this was, yeah, children who went through our intervention had a um, lower BMI um, than children who continued um, with um, regular early head start. Um, we also saw some really interesting kind of generalized effects. Um, so one of my postdocs was interested in kind of how black parents show up for their children and really interested in reflective functioning. Um, and she thought that one of the reasons why a lot of times in our measures of parenting, um, Black people end up not looking quite as good as our white samples is because of these biases and the ways that we think about what constitutes good parenting and our own failure to recognize the true strengths of, um, of other families that um, you know, may not look like me. Um, and so she, as part of that project, she transcribed all of the parent-child videos, um, including um, uh, parent-child videos. And so at the bottom of those transcriptions, we actually had a word count. And we looked to see whether or not parents who had been in Recipe for Success were speaking to their children more. And what we found is that in five minutes, they tended to produce about 200 more words on average. Um, you know, you've all heard about the you know, kind of famous Hart and Risley study that shows that children living in poverty hear 30 million fewer words by the time they start preschool than children in, um, you know, from um, families with um, people like professors as parents. Um, and so if our parents are speaking 200 more words per five minutes, um, that could help, you know, help reduce that kind of disparity. Another one of my graduate students um, loves the research of Mar Martha Wadsworth um, and, you know, kind of how parents engage in problem solving and, you know, coping around parent challenges. Um, and so she included some measures to see whether, you know, our parents were just learning how to support their children's self-regulation or generalizing, you know, those skills to other areas. And she found that our parents were actually better problem solvers, more likely to engage in engagement coping rather than disengaging when they had a problem. Um, and that the parents were also showing a little bit better 
um, self um, self control themselves. Um, one of my graduate students here is really interested in how it is that we account for these differences in um, you know that we saw that we saw, um, and so she's been looking at the recordings, or she's been listening to you know all of these recordings that we have of actual home visits. Um, and in general, there are five things that, you know, home visitors want out of a good home visit. They want there to be, um, you know, a strong working alliance between the home visitor and the parent. They want there to be good educational content. They want the home visitor to be kind of sensitive and responsive to parents' needs. They want high parent engagement and high child engagement. And so my graduate student, um, Sarah Broughton has done these latent profile analyses, and what she sees is that there are three different kinds of home visits that we're typically seeing in the data. <clears throat> and you can see that, you know, it's that green line at the top that represents, you know, the um, you know, home visits that are characterized by high levels of all of these um, five criteria. And you can also see that if a home visitor had a family and recipe for success, 82% of those home visits were characterized or fell into the screen profile compared to 40% of that same home visitors visits with, um, with their other clients, right? And so this is just driven by the curriculum. There's no difference in home visitors at all. Um, home visitors are delivering all of, you know, the same home visitors are delivering all of these. Um, what you can also see is that red profile, um, which is characterized by very low levels of parent engagement and working alliance, only 5% of our families were falling in that category um, compared to 27% of usual practice. Um, when Sarah did a multiple mediator analysis to see which of these uh, mediators was actually driving changes in the outcomes. What she found was that a lot of the um, parent outcomes were being affected by getting those high levels of parent engagement, and a lot of the child outcomes were actually um, a result of just participating in the lessons. So, um, you know, they weren't related to any of these mechanisms, um, but they were just um, related to having these multiple opportunities to practice. Um, the self-regulation skills in the um, cooking activities. We also have um, now looked at the sustained benefits of our um, intervention. So looking through the nine and 18 month follow-up, um, and these are analyses that DJ has, has done. And what we see is that kind of that initial change in core parenting behaviors is sustained over time. Um, so the um, lines don't become bigger or smaller over time, but what we saw um, continues at that same level um, for 18 months. So by the time, you know, by that time, children are, you know, getting, you know, they're definitely in Head Start and many of them are getting prepared to um, transition to kindergarten. Um, parents' learning support is also sustained. Parents' sensitive scaffolding is sustained children's emotional and behavioral self-control, um, those effects are sustained, their attention and persistence is sustained, as well as their compliance and cooperation. We also have some really interesting moderated effects for some of our highest risk samples. So um, two of my former graduate students who are now postdocs did latent transition analyses to see um, whether what the um, changes in parenting looked like over time. And so here's what they found, um, three different profiles of parenting. You basically got a high, medium, and low. Um, but what they found is that if you were in that low profile, initially at baseline, 77% of them stayed in that low profile. Um, if they were in usual practice early head start. In contrast, only 27% of our recipe for success families stayed in that low profile. Um, if um, in looking at that transition from baseline to post intervention, what we saw is that only 15% of the usual practice families made that transition. 
um, you know, showing improved behavior compared to 58% of our rescue for success families. So we're really excited about that. Um, and then what you saw is that once they made that transition, they tended to stabilize. So there were no differences at all, um, no further transitions um, after from kind of the post-intervention period through the follow-up period. Um, so we're interested in that, or we're really excited about that. Um, and then finally, we also looked at telomere length. Um, and here we found these really, really interesting effects of telomere length on, um, you know, an, the treatment effect of on telomere length, um, but it was only for the children um, who had parents with depression. So about 45% of our parents are reporting clinically significant levels of depression. Um, we know that children who are living in poverty and have a parent with depression are at really, really high risk of all sorts of negative outcomes. Um, telomere length is this um, measure of kind of cellular aging. It reflects kind of chronic stress. And what we were seeing is that if you had a parent who was you know, more responsive and giving you more choices and providing you with better support, you ended up feeling less stressed. Um, and this is one of the first instances that I know of where we were able to, or where anybody has really been able to show that a psychosocial preventive intervention can also kind of get under the skin of these children. Um, so we're super excited about that. Um, we saw some kind of similar findings in parent telomere link. Um, uh, Quickly, um, compared to nothing at all, early head start tends to have small, um, small intervention effects of 0.09 to 0.20 um, compared to early head start. Recipe for success produces significant intervention effects um, that range pretty widely from 0.16 to 0.74, but most of them tend to be about you know, 0.28 or 0.30. Um, so we were able to kind of, you know, by Implementing our intervention, we were able to, you know, at least double the effects that you tend to see in Early Head Start. Early Head Start costs an average of $4,800 per family, um, but that's only because most families stay in the program for about eight months. If you stayed for the entire time, it would cost $25,000 to provide Early Head Start home visits. Um, our program costs an extra $300. Um, so a very, very small percentage of that um, total budget. Um, and a lot of that budget already has to do with getting a curriculum and providing professional development support. Um, and so by kind of re, um, by um, changing the funding um, or reallocating some of the funds in Early Head Start, we're able to produce these pretty incredible um, results. Um, we're now working with the Wisconsin Department of Children and Families to make rec Recipe for Success part of all home visiting programs. Um, and we're also working with Parents as Teachers, um, you know, which is the organization that provides the most training for the most organizations across the country in how to conduct home visits. Um, we're hoping to make Recipe for Success something that they feature um, and um, train all of their home visitors, um, home visit organizations and as well. Um, so we're really, really excited about kind of these conversations that we're having and um, collaborations with these you know, state and national organizations. Um, so yeah, final slide, um, interventions should address root causes, be well-grounded in research, meet families, perceived needs, and be easy to use by embedding these new interventions within evidence-based programs. Um, we may be able to really capitalize on the strengths of the services that are already out there and really up their game in this effort to um, pursue kind of continual quality improvement. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Rob. It's amazing. I, it's, you see a presentation like this and you just wonder, how can we get this 
program installed everywhere in every state because it's just doing incredible stuff. Yeah, well, um, hopefully yeah. that's what we'll be able to move forward. Yeah. Forward. So we, we have a couple minutes maybe for questions if anybody can stick around. Rob can maybe stick around. I will check. Uh, there was one question asking if you could sing the waiting song for everybody. <laughs> No. <laughs> there goes my question. Um, actually, I will ask something. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but uh, it's all like just because it's so interesting. Can you say briefly, like, um, you know, you, a lot of times you think about kind of implementation stuff with this. So you're going to have some families that are much more interested in doing this automatically, others that are very resistant. Um, you know, Wendy's breakfast, $3 you know meal and taco bell you can eat so many things for five bucks there so there's just so it's so easy to not do this i you know i'm guilty of that type of eating habit um so can you say anything about kind of do you get into the implementation evaluation much uh in terms of compliers versus um yeah, yeah so so it's really interesting um there's a lot of variability um and you know, like I said, I think we're one of the only um, you know, research teams to have the um, audio recordings of what actually happens in home visits. Um, and so when we talked to all of our partners, they all said, oh, yeah, we only do coaching of parents. We recognize how important it is to get the parent involved. When we actually listen to the sessions, there's a lot of hanging out. Um, and then there are a lot of people who have this kind of implicit model that, you know, if I show the parent how to interact with their child, then they'll do it that same way after I leave. Um, and we don't think that there's very much evidence for um, that kind of um, approach. Um, so it, it's interesting, you know, as I said, we gave a lot of um, we gave a lot of kind of explicit instructions and modeling for how the interventions could go. Um, some home visitors do a perfect, perfect session. Um, it almost kind of, you know, makes you beclept or emotional um, just hearing how well it can go. Um, others don't do such a good job, um, but our sense in even those sessions that aren't going very well, is that they, um, the recipe for success part of the whole lesson is the best part. Um, my um, grad student, Sarah, is looking at, or Sarah Broughton, um, for her dissertation, is looking at what happens for families who work um, with families, or what happens to home educators who work with families with whom they don't have a very good working alliance, right? Um, that are really struggling to be on the same page. And what she's showing is that if you have those families and you implement recipe for success, you end up provide, you, you end up being as effective in moving parent and child outcomes as you are with a parent who uh, you do have a good working alliance with, um, but aren't in recipe for success. Um, and so this may be a really, nice, interesting way of kind of helping some of our home visitors who are less skilled or who are having more challenging relationships with families um, improve the quality of the work that they do with those families. Great, thank you. Um, I You're getting a lot of nice comments. I saved the chat so I can send it to you afterwards. People are really saying a lot of great things about the um, all the different terrific aspects of your intervention and the findings and all of that. So um, I will send that to you and I think we're out of time. I don't see any other quick questions, but anybody who's still around can follow up with Rob. Uh, he's always very happy, I know, to interact with anybody around this research. So um, please seek him out. Thank you again, Rob, for being here and I'm really hoping we'll see you on the PRC schedule again in the next two years, maybe. 
Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, like DJ said, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Great. Bye, Thanks everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you.